Good day, Grade Twelves. Welcome to this next lesson on physical science. Um, and just to let you know right off from the bat that tomorrow we'll be having a science lesson as well. I know it's public holiday, but um, I'm going to go vote in the morning and then I'll be here this afternoon, the next tomorrow afternoon, to give you these lessons. So please join us tomorrow so that you can learn a bit more about the physical science. Um, as you may remember from yesterday's lesson, we were doing vertical projectile motion. And before we do anything else, I'd like to remind you of the equations of motion. So your equations of motion, which you get given on your formula sheet are VF is equal to VI plus A delta T. VF squared is equal to VI squared plus 2A delta X. Delta X is equal to VI delta T plus a half A delta T squared. And Delta X is equal to VF plus VI over 2 delta T. Because at the moment we're doing equations of motion and we were doing equations of motion with respect to vertical projectile motion. So what does that mean? First of all, we need to talk about what each of these mean. VF is your final velocity. Okay. Final velocity. Okay. VI is what? VI is your initial velocity. Initial velocity. A, now, we only talk about A to be acceleration. But now, some people and some textbooks, when we talk about vertical projectile motion, acceleration is acceleration due to gravity. So instead of using A, they often use a G. And delta T is obviously the change in time. And delta X is the generic form for your change in displacement. But again, what happens is, is that because we're talking about vertical projectile motion, which means we're going up and down, a lot of people will write delta Y. So for example, this would change to being delta Y is equal to VI delta T plus a half G delta T squared. And it's the same thing. It is just rewritten with a delta Y and a G to show that we're talking about acceleration due to gravity. But this is what you get given on the formula sheet, so I'm very happy for you to use this, and that's what I will be using. Um, yeah, okay, let's move on. So the best way to get grips with this thing is to talk about, um, to do some examples, and we started with doing this example yesterday, and I don't think I finished it. I'm pretty sure I didn't. But even if I did, I kind of want to go through it again because of the fact that it is quite a tricky example. And I think that we need to go through it nice and slowly. So it says a ball is dropped vertically from a cliff. So here is our cliff. It is dropped, so its initial velocity is zero. Okay, it says if the vertical distance covered in the last second okay, is equal to the distance covered in the first four seconds. So if this distance here is the distance covered in the first four seconds, so that's t equals naught to t equals four seconds. Okay, and then they're saying that that is the same as the distance covered, sorry, and I've changed color pen, doesn't matter. Same as the distance covered during the last second. During the last second. Okay, one second. So it says find the height of the cliff. They want the height. Okay, so do you agree that we can say that we've got some information? So for the first four seconds, and I know we did part of this yesterday, and I want to go through it again with you to make sure you understand, okay? Do you agree the initial velocity is zero? Okay, the initial velocity is zero. The final velocity we haven't a clue. The time taken is four seconds. The acceleration is acceleration due to gravity, which is 9.8. And the delta x, we're just going to let be x, okay? Then, for the last second, let's change the color so you can see what I'm doing. Let's go last second. During the last one second, the initial velocity, we haven't a clue. 
The final velocity we haven't a clue. And remember yesterday I went on a little rampage about the fact that you cannot set the final velocity zero just because you're hitting the ground, because otherwise you would just be hovering just above the ground. Your acceleration is again 9.8, and I'm choosing down as positive, by the way. That's why I've got a positive acceleration and a positive displacement. My delta x is again going to be x, but this time my time is one second because remember this is delta t. So my delta t is one second. So let us see. Do you agree that I could work out? Let's look at our equations. We've got vf equals vi plus a delta t. vf squared is equal to vi squared plus 2a delta x. We have got delta x is equal to vi delta t plus a half a delta t squared and delta x is equal to vf plus vi over 2 delta t. Now you guys don't have to write this down every time because you've got the formula sheet next to you and I really urge you to do these questions with the formula sheet right next to you. So we're going to look at the first four seconds and do you see that since we have the initial velocity we can tick it okay we've got the change in time we've got the acceleration so we could find the displacement which is great because that's one of our variables so let's do that so we've got delta x is equal to vi delta t plus a half a delta t squared which is the initial velocity is zero times by the change in time, which is four, plus a half times 9.8 times by four squared. So that is going to be 4.9 times by 16. And I don't know what that is in my head. So let's just get out our calculator and clear it. And we've got 4.9 times 16 and that equals 78 comma 4. So that's 78 comma 4 meters. So that means that this distance here is 78 comma 4 and this distance here is 78 comma 4. But do you agree that that doesn't really help me because I don't know what the gap is yet. It could be zero or it could be a thousand billion meters. I don't know. Obviously, it won't be a thousand billion, but you understand what I'm saying. We don't know what that gap is. So we need to find out what the total height is. And one way to do that is to find what that gap is. Okay. So now if we look at this, we can now fill that that in a 78 comma 4. Now let's change color and see if we can find out what information we have. Right, this time we've got the acceleration, so we can tick the acceleration. Okay, we have the displacement. We've got the displacement. Um, and displacement. We've got the time. Okay, we have the time. So we again are going to use this equation and we're going to find the initial velocity. We're going to find the velocity with which it starts falling here because the initial velocity with which it starts here is also the final velocity for that period there. So we're going to do that. We're going to find that initial velocity. Okay, so let's do that. So we're going to go delta x is equal to vi delta t plus a half a delta t squared. So this is 78 comma 4 is equal to the initial velocity times the change in time, which is 1, plus a half times 9.8 times by 1 squared. So that's 78 comma 4 is equal to vi plus 4 comma 9. So do you agree that vi is equal to 78 comma 4 minus 4 comma 9? So therefore, VI is equal to 14 minus 9 is 5, carry uh, is 15, 7 minus 4 is 3, and that's 7. So that's 73.5 meters per second. So it hits this point here at 73,5 meters per second. Now, there are two ways to do it from this point. You can either work out the final velocity at this point for this movement 
and then find the displacement or you could go from here to here, find that total displacement and then subtract the 78.4 or just take that. No, you don't even have to do that. You can find that final displacement and then add that 78.4 there. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to find this distance here. OK, so again, our initial velocity this time is zero because we're going from the top. Our acceleration is still 9,8. Our displacement, we haven't a clue. That's what we're trying to find out. We don't have the time, but we do have the final velocity, which happens to be 73,5. So we want the total displacement. So do you agree that we could actually use, sorry, I'm just trying to find my pen. There it is. We're going to use this equation here. So we've got VF squared is equal to VI squared plus 2A delta X. We've got the VF squared, we've got the VI squared, we've got the acceleration, we can get the X. So the final velocity is 73,5 squared equals the initial velocity of 0 plus 2 times 9,8 delta X. So do you agree that delta X has to equal, if I just divide both sides, I've got 73,5 all squared divided by 19,6, because that's 2 times 9.8, and now I need my calculator. So I've got 73.5 all squared divided by 19.6. Point six equals 275.63, 275.63. So the whole of this is 275,63 meters. Okay, so what are we saying? We're saying that from here to here is 275,63 meters. And then from here to here is 78.4. So the height of the cliff is going to be 275,63 plus 78,4, which is 3, 0, 8 and 5 is 13, so it's 14, carry 1, that's a 5, so it's 254.03 meters. Hmm, it's quite a nice question, hey? Quite sneaky, but a very, very nice question. Okay, let's look at the next one. Now we've got a ball A is thrown vertically upwards from a height H with the speed of 12 meters per second. Okay, at the same instant, a second ball B is dropped from the same height as ball A. Both balls undergo free fall and eventually hit the ground. Okay, calculate the time it takes for ball A to return to the starting point. Okay, so we've got a certain height, okay, which is H, right? Ball A is thrown vertically upwards, okay, that's ball A, with a speed of 12 meters per second, and that's ball A. At the same instant, ball B is just dropped from the same height. So its initial velocity is zero, okay? Both balls undergo free fall and eventually hit the ground. So do you agree that ball B is just gonna go straight on, but ball A is gonna go up and then it's gonna come down, right? Now it says calculate the time it takes for ball A to return to its starting point. So you don't want it to when it goes to the ground, we want it to work out just when it gets down here. But do you realize that what goes up must come down? So if I work out how long it takes to get to the top of its arc, and then I double it, then I will know how long it took to get from there to there. Okay, do you agree? So what do we have? We've got our initial velocity. Okay, we've got to choose a direction. And I'm going to choose up as positive. It doesn't matter which way you choose, you just need to let the examiner or your teacher know always, okay? So initial velocity is equal to 12 meters per second upwards, okay? 
The final velocity is zero because we're looking at the point that it turns. The acceleration is always towards the Earth, so it's going to be minus 9,8, and they want the time. So if we look at our formulas, we can see that Vf is equal to Vi plus A delta T is the perfect formula for this. So that's what we're going to use. We're going to go Vf is equal to Vi plus A delta T. The final velocity is 12. No, I'm wrong. The final velocity is 0. Um, black. 0 is equal to the initial velocity, which is 12, plus minus 9.8 delta T. Therefore, delta T is going to be minus 12 over minus 9,8, which equals what? So let's just go find our calculator. So that's going to be 12 divided by 9.8. Why didn't I put the minuses in? Because they cancel each other. Um, and equal 1,22 seconds. So that equals 1,22 seconds. But that's the time just to get up, right? And they want to know the calculate the time it takes the ball A to return to its starting point. So what do we need to do? We need to double this because what goes up must come down. So that becomes 2,44 seconds. The final answer here is 2,44 seconds. Right, now it says calculate the distance between ball A and ball B when ball A is at its maximum height. Okay, so do you realize that the whole time that ball A has been going up, ball B has been going down, right? The whole time. And it's been going at the same time. So the distance between them is growing. Okay, ball A is going up and ball B is going Sorry, just a second. Okay, right. So let's just do this. Ball A is going up and ball B is going down. And they want to know what is that distance when ball A is at its maximum height. But we know the time it took to get there is 1,22 seconds, which means we can find out how high this is and then we can find out how far ball B has traveled in the same amount of time and then we can add these two times and we'll get the total height, the total distance. Do you understand? So let's do that first. First of all, we need to find the maximum height of ball A. So let's do that. Maximum height of ball A. Okay, so what do we know? We know, again, we're choosing up as positive because we just have already, so we're going to keep it that. So the initial velocity again is going to be 12, and the final velocity again is going to be 0, and acceleration again is minus 9,8, and we want delta x. So we can use Vf squared equals Vi squared plus 2a delta x. Agreed? The final velocity is going to be 0, is equal to the initial velocity, which is 12 squared, plus 2 times minus 9,8 delta x. So if I take this across, this becomes minus 144 is equal to minus 19,6 delta x. So I can divide both sides by minus 19,6. And I will get delta x, because those cancel. So let's get out our calculators. So I'm going to do 144 divided by 19.6 equals 7,35 meters. 7,35 meters. So that becomes 7,35 meters. So that's the maximum height from here to here of ball A. That's how far it's gone up. It's 7,35 meters up, okay? Now, during the same time, exactly the same amount of time, ball B has been traveling down, okay? So let's talk about ball B. Okay, now remember we chose up as positive, so you have to be careful about this now. We chose up as positive. The initial velocity of ball B is zero, right? Because it is dropped. The final velocity, we have an aphogius clue. 
the acceleration is minus 9 comma 8 again because up is chosen as positive the time is 1 comma 2 2 seconds and we want the delta x we want the delta x so let us look at our equations of motion so let me just write this out vf squared is equal to vi squared plus 2a delta x delta x is equal to vi delta t plus a half a delta t squared and delta x is equal to vf plus vi over 2 delta t okay now what do we want we want the delta x so we want something with delta x in it so it's one of these three that's out right we've got the time so that's out we don't have the final velocity so that's out so we're using this equation here okay so i'm going to write up here delta x is equal to vi delta t plus a half a delta t squared so the initial velocity is zero plus a half times minus nine comma eight time is the time of one comma two two all squared so let's do that on our calculator so we go 0.5 times bracket negative 9.8 close bracket times bracket 1.22 mm -mm, 0.22 bracket squared equals and that's minus 7.29 so that is equal to minus 7 comma 29 meters so that is correct why is that correct because we have chosen up as positive and ball b is traveling down but we want to know the distance how far they are apart so do you agree ball a has traveled to seven up 7.35 meters and ball B has traveled down 7.29. So what we're going to do is we're just going to add the 7.29 to this. So 5 and 9 is 14. That's a 6 and that's a 14. So therefore they are 14.64 meters apart from each other at the time when ball A is at its maximum height. Hmm. Okay. Grade 12s, I would really urge you to watch this video again and when you get to the beginning of this question that you pause the video and you try this question for yourself because this is an exam level question and it's a very nice example. All right, now we're going to move on to graphs of motion. Don't worry, we're going to do more equations of motion questions but they tend to come up in combination with graphs. I thought that what we'd do is I would teach you the graphs of motion and then once we've done that, we can go back to doing a typical exam question that combines both the equations of motion and graphs of motion. Now, there are two types of graphs of motion. There's the constant velocity and the constant acceleration. So let's start with constant velocity. Okay, for a stationary object, it's not moving. The object is not moving, which means its position does not change. And since velocity is delta x over delta t, if the delta x is zero, then obviously its velocity is going to be zero. And similarly, if acceleration Acceleration is change in velocity over change in time, which is going to be zero over delta t, which is zero. So for a stationary object, your delta x is zero, your velocity is zero, or your position does not change, so, so, so therefore the delta x is zero, because that means delta x, remember, is change in position, and that's important. So therefore the final displacement minus the initial displacement is zero which means the velocity is zero and acceleration is zero. So if they say, Jane is standing two meters away from the bench, do you agree that her position is two meters away from her starting point? And it remains like that, okay? The velocity is obviously zero and acceleration is zero. Okay, those are the easiest scenarios you're ever gonna get. Now, if you've got a motion at a constant velocity, 
This means that the position of the object changes at the same rate. So if you look at this little dude, who may or may not be Jane, okay, <laughs> due date, you will see that in the first 100 seconds, they have traveled 100 meters, but in the first 50 seconds, they've traveled 50 meters. So you can see the ratio is the same, okay? So T is naught to T is 50, the displacement is 50. From T is 50 to T is 100, the displacement is 50. So we could draw some velocity versus time graphs, okay? So if we look at that, we can see that when the displacement was 50, the time was 50, and when the displacement was 100, the time was 100. Okay, let's just go back up. When the displacement was 50, the time was 50. When the displacement was 100, the time was 100. So if we go back here, we can see that when the displacement is 50, the time is 50, and when the displacement is 100, the time is 100, right? So what is special about that? Well, what's special about that is the fact that we can use the gradient of this because we know the velocity equals change in displacement over change in time. But do you see the position is on the y-axis and time is on the x-axis? So that is actually the same as saying change in y over change in x, which is actually the gradient. So what we're saying is the gradient of this graph gives us the value for the, the velocity, acceleration versus time graph. Okay, I mean the, sorry, these are wrong. I don't know why I did this. This is the velocity versus time graph. I don't know why I did this, that shouldn't happen. This is the velocity versus time graph in meters per second. And this is the acceleration versus time graph in meters per second squared. Okay, so the gradient of the displacement versus time graph or position versus time graph gives us our velocity. So if you have a look at this, you can see that this point here, the change in your time is 50 and the change in the displacement is 50. So you're gonna have 50 over 50, which equals one. And similarly, if you look at this point, we've got the 100 divided by 100, which is 1. So the gradient there is 1, which means, as far as we're concerned, we are traveling at 1 meter per second, constant velocity. The gradient of this gives us our acceleration. Okay, why? Because acceleration equals change in velocity over change in time. And you can see there's no change in velocity. So that is zero over the change in time, which is just zero. Okay. Let's not talk about the area under the graph. Okay, I just want to raise this. Let's talk about the area of the graph. So what have we said so far? We have said that the gradient of this gives you this gradient. We've also said the gradient of that gives you this. Okay. Now let's talk about the area. Do you agree that we know that this, the velocity equals change in displacement over change in time? So therefore I can save, I can solve for delta x. I can go delta x is equal to v delta t. So what am I saying? I'm saying that the velocity times by the change in time, the velocity times by the change in time gives me my displacement. So the area under this graph gives me my displacement at a specific point. So for example, if I had traveled at one meter per second for 40 seconds, that is a square, so it's going to be one or rectangle times by 40 is going to be 40. So if I then look at the time here and I take the time up across, I can see my displacement was 40. So the area under a velocity versus time graph gives me the displacement at that point. Now we've got negative velocity. 
And remember that velocity and acceleration are vectors. In fact, dis displacement is also a vector. But the point is that because it's a vector, it can go below the horizontal, below the zero line. Okay, so now she walks back to her house, but she walks at exactly the same rate, okay? Because she's going in the opposite direction, we're going to have a negative one velocity. It's exactly the same as before, except that because it's in the opposite direction, it's now minus one, okay? Which means that the gradient has to be negative. Okay, we started off 100 meters away and now we're at zero meters away, right? So after 100 seconds, we're back to where we started. So therefore, you'll notice that this gradient equals minus 1, which gives me the velocity. The gradient of this is 0, which gives me the acceleration. Right, now... Let's look at the graphs of constant acceleration. So here we are speeding up. But at a constant rate. Okay, we're speeding up at a constant rate. So acceleration is defined as the rate of change of velocity, which for us normal people is delta V over delta time. As soon as you see rate of change, you know that you're dividing that thing by time. So rate of change means divide by time. So constant velocity means that the velocity changes at a constant rate. So for example, we've got this minibus and this minibus miraculously accelerates from a stop street and it's going to accelerate at a constant acceleration. So if you look here, do you see that it's traveled at 2.5 meters in one second? Then it's traveled five meters in one second. Then what is it done? Okay, it's traveled, so the distance, sorry, not five. So this distance here is 10 minus 2 comma 5, which is 7 comma 5. This distance here is going to be 12 comma 5. And this distance here is going to be, what is that? That is going to be 18 comma 19, 19 comma 5. Okay, so do you see that it's actually... Oh my word, I cannot subtract it, it's 17,5. So do you see that the displacement is increasing every time? Okay, the displacement is increasing every time. Okay, so if we had to draw a position versus time graph, you will see that the position versus time graph is getting steeper and steeper and steeper. It is not a perfect straight line, it is getting bigger. During the first second, they've only traveled 2.5 meters. At t equals 10, we're, when t equals 2, shall I say, we're now at 10. And when t equals 3, we're at 22,5 and obviously 40 is off the chart. So what we're saying is that a position versus time graph for an acceleration is actually not a straight line. And we can see that the gradient increases with time. So the gradient is showing us that we are speeding up. Now, in order to draw velocity versus time graph, we need to calculate the velocities of the minibus. Okay, so do you see that we've got, and what's important is the average velocity between the two points is equal to the instantaneous velocity halfway to, between these two points. Oof, that sounds tricky. But let's think about this way. What we're saying is that if we can find the average velocity between these two points here, then we're effectively finding the instantaneous velocity at a specific point. Okay, so let us do some examples. We are now going to find the velocity at one second. The velocity at one second. So the velocity at one second is equal to the change in displacement over the change in time. The change in displacement is five meters. Okay, because that there is five meters, do you agree? And the time is going to be one and a half seconds. The time is one and a half seconds. Okay, so that there is what we're saying. So we've got 
the change in displacement is five meters and the change in time is one and a half seconds. The velocity at one second is five meters per second, right? If we look at the velocity at two seconds here, at this point here, we're looking at the change in displacement across, remember what we said, the average velocity between two points is equal to the instantaneous velocity halfway between those two points. So what we're saying is that if we want the velocity at 10 meters, I mean at two seconds, we need to find the average velocity between a point that's half double that, okay? So in other words, we're looking for the time from two and a half to one and a half or from um, three to two, three to one, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So in other words, what I could have done with this, I could have said the velocity for two seconds is actually equal to the change in displacement from three seconds minus one second, because then two seconds would be halfway between that. And the displacement at three seconds is 22,5 minus the displacement at one second, which is 2,5, which is going to then be, if you look at it, 22.5 minus 2.5 is 20 divided by two, which is 10 meters per second. So what we're assuming then is that this instantaneous velocity is equal to the average between these two. Now, if I looked at the three seconds, I'm going to have to look at either T4 to T2, or I can look at 3.5 minus 2.5. But let's look at rather three and four and two, because since we have that, okay? So I could say that the average velocity at three seconds is equal to four seconds minus two seconds, but then I have to go 40 minus 10. Okay, because that is the displacement at two seconds and this is displacement at 40 seconds, I mean at four seconds. So that's 30 divided by two, which equals 15 meters per second. So what are we saying? We're saying that at one second, at one second here, the velocity was five meters per second. Okay, at two seconds, this point here, the velocity was 10 meters per second. And at three seconds, the velocity was 15 meters per second. So you can see that it's actually going up by a certain rate. It's going up by one, at every second, it's going up by five meters per second. Do you see that? So we actually can work out the acceleration here because we know that it's going up for every second, it's going up by five. Right, so then if we want to draw the velocity versus time graph, we can just plot it. So we've got 0, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, and we know 5, 10, 15. And you can see it's a beautiful straight line graph. Now, if you remember, if it was a constant velocity, it would just be a straight line graph going across. But because it is going at a, now going at constant acceleration, the velocity is increasing, and you've got a beautiful straight line going up. Okay, so this is the velocity versus time graph. Now we need to use this velocity versus time graph to work out the acceleration. And we're going to use the gradient, okay? The gradient, because we know that acceleration is the average velocity over the average time or the change in velocity over change in time. So if we look at, uh, I don't know, it doesn't matter. We look at this point here and we look at this point here. It doesn't matter as long as you're using two different points. We're going to use the change in y, okay, over the change in x. This is the change in y and this is the change in x. And we're going to use that to get our gradient. So the change in y is a change in velocity, which is 15 minus 5. The change in time is going to be 3 minus 1. So therefore, our acceleration is 5. So it's going to be a constant across of 5. Okay. So therefore, our constant acceleration graphs look like this. And again, we can use the gradient of this to get our acceleration. And we can use the area of this to get our velocity. 
and we can use the area of this to get our position. And if you wanted to, we could use the slope at a specific point to get the instantaneous velocity. So this would give me the instantaneous velocity. So we don't often use that one, but we do use these. So think about the gradient goes to the left, to the right, and the area goes backwards if you've got position, velocity, acceleration. Right, so now obviously those were just basic general graphs of motion. Now we're going to talk about graphs of motion with respect to vertical projectile motion. You know what, I'm actually going to stop there for the simple reason that now we're going to be looking specifically at graphs of motion with respect to vertical projectile motion. So what I would like to suggest you do is you go through these and make sure you understand your graphs of motion. Grade 12 is kind of tricky because what happens in the curriculum is they teach you graphs of motion in grade 10. Okay, and then they skip it, they leave it alone, and they teach it to you again in grade 12 with respect to vertical projectile motion, and they assume that you'll remember everything you learned in grade 10, which is a little bit crazy because who remembers everything that they've learned from a year and a half back? So what I would seriously urge you to do is go through these questions, go through these graphs now, make sure you understand how we come about the constant velocity graphs and the constant acceleration graphs and how we can use them using the, either the gradients and the areas and make sure you can do that because if you can do that for basic graphs and it doesn't matter whether we're using them for um, horizontal motion that we've done before or if we're using them for vertical projectile motion it's the same principle okay so that's it for tonight um please grade 12s join me tomorrow we will continue with vertical projectile motion and we'll be doing graphs of motion with respect directly to vertical projectile motion have a great day or evening